wants peace in this house. everybody welcome to episode 19 of 13 o'clock i hope everybody had a good holiday yeah we had a good one we did it was yeah. nice saw Rogue of... one too yeah that's right yeah did we say that on the last episode i, I can't did. remember I now probably we, we, were just, we were just no we were just talking about going to see it I think. yeah okay yeah we did see it it was awesome yeah, yeah. i thought it was pretty cool i recommend it yeah <clears throat> but anyway so uh this episode we're kind of it's not really serial killer it's kind of serial killer and haunting uh he's not a serial killer this he's a mass Bill. murder we're talking about the Amityville horror. Right. Which probably the most famous quote unquote haunted house case in American history. I've always liked this case just because it's an entertaining story. Yeah. There's a, a lot behind it. And I, and I always used to love like listening to Art Bell and they'd have uh, the witnesses to the case, you know, giving their testimony. Yeah. And it, it always to me sounded convincing, like like something really did go down. But we're going to get more into it. Yeah, there is also, I mean, I'm sure most people know there is a gigantic controversy about this case, whether it's totally a hoax, whether it was just blown out of proportion or whatever. And you have the Warrens involved, and, and whenever they're involved, man, it always adds another element to it. Because, of, yeah, yeah I kinda maybe be, not, you know. I Although, kinda, yeah, I, I kind of begrudgingly appreciate the Warrens because they were they were entertaining. They, they were Remember when they would show up on like Geraldo and all the talk shows? Oh, I like, remember that. I used to love those, those I remember shows. that. Whether or not any of it was true, you know, it doesn't really matter. They were entertaining. Yeah. They were entertaining. And I have to say that the original Amityville Horror movie from 1979 or whenever it was, that scared the crap out of me when yeah. I was a kid. Yeah, it was a great book and it was a great movie. Yeah. Whether um, any of it happened or not, eh. We're going to get into that. We're yeah. going to get in. We're going to talk about that. We're going to see if there's anything to this. Yeah. We're, we'll examine the evidence and then... We'll, we'll consider it. Like yeah. our... <laughs> like our opinion means dick, but whatever. Right, right. Well, but, you know, know, it's an entertaining subject to talk about, I guess. Yeah, and you guys will be entertained and, you know, with, with our ideas. And if you guys have any ideas on it, you can make comments. But we, we know this case pretty well. Yeah. So. Well, actually, you've written about this case in your books. Yeah, actually. Well, yeah, my new book that's coming out, which yeah. will be out in 2017, it's called The Unseen Hand. And it's kind of like a compendium of all different uh, poltergeist, mostly poltergeist cases, some haunting like gray shaded yeah we're not sure if it's haunting or poltergeist right right. and uh there is a chapter about this in there um yeah and don't give it away too much we'll just but we'll 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 go through it we'll go through it uh in in due course okay so now if you saw the movie or if you read the book by jay anson which came out in 1977 then you will know that the one thing that is indisputably true about the amityville case was that the house at 112 Ocean Avenue on uh, in Amityville in Long Island was the scene of a mass murder. Yeah, that did happen. That did happen. It happened in 1974, and uh, it was Ronald Butch DeFeo. Ronnie DeFeo. And he shot and killed his entire family while yeah. they were sleeping. A lot of interviews with him. He's a pretty wily character, kind of weasel-like. If you were to cross, if you were to crossbreed. A junkie and a weasel, that would be Ronnie DeFeo. Yeah. Yeah. And the weird thing about the case is that, well, now, initially, they didn't think it was him because what happened was he shot them all while they were sleeping. The next day, he went to work like normal. Yeah. And then when he got home from work, then he suddenly ran down the street to his normal bar that he went to where yeah. all his friends hung out and said, my mother and father have been shot. And he got all his friends to come to the house and they called the cops. And they initially, the cops initially took uh, Butch DeFeo into custody to protect him because Butch DeFeo was saying it was a mob <coughs> hit. Was saying it was a mob hit, which wasn't as crazy as it sounds. Not because, in those days. Mm. Well, and because some oh. of their relatives, I believe it was the mother's uncle or the father's uncle, was um was either in the Genovese crime family or related to someone who was. Yeah. So, you know, not totally outrageous to right. say that. But, you know, as time went on and they questioned him and stuff like that, his statements were very inconsistent. And Now, some of the cops that at the time 
instantly suspected that, that he, it was him. That it was him, but yeah. they couldn't. They had. They couldn't do anything about it. They had to go through with the investigation. Well, yeah, you have to go through. Yeah, because they of could be. They could have been wrong. Right. But, but the weird thing. Well, the weird thing about him is that he he's still alive, right? He's yeah, not, he's, he's in, in prison. prison. Um, they never really determined how he did it. How he did it, or yeah. really what the motive was, like right. why that particular. There's a lot of theories about it. One of the weird things about the case is that they were all killed in bed. They didn't seem to wake up. Which was weird because he didn't have a suppressor or anything. They were killed no. with a rifle. Yeah, it was... And uh, the parents were shot twice each yeah. in the back. Yeah. And the weapon that he used, if I remember correctly, was a four forty four Marlin lever action yes, rifle. Yes, that's correct. And I, I, I know that rifle. And four forty four Marlin is a big bore long cartridge that's very loud. It's like 44 Magnums. Imagine a 44 Magnum pistol cartridge on total roid rage. It's four times, three and three and a half, four times longer than a normal 44 Magnum pistol cartridge. It's, it's, it's like almost like a, a reboot of an antique rifle cartridge. Yeah. Uh, which is, they're fat and long. They don't neck down, you know, into a smaller caliber. And that's, it's very loud. Very loud, and hard-hitting car. That's what seems odd. One, it seems odd that the family, that everybody, like it was the parents who presumably were shot first, and then his brothers and sisters, they all they were all found dead in bed, face in bed. down. Right. You would think that some of them would have woken up or gotten right. up. And another weird thing, too, is that the neighbors didn't report any gunshots. Yeah. All they heard was the dog barking. Yeah. Now they had a dog named Shaggy, I believe. Being from a family that uh, loves firearms and stuff, uh, you know, I've accidentally fired off a few rounds indoors. And, oh, you told me yeah, that. Yeah, my dad today. accidentally. <laughs> and you know, a shooting up the house. Yeah, like well, do. when you're a kid and you're, uh, you know, not really paying attention to something you're doing, you know, you're practicing with your new pistol or something like that, and you have your headphones on, you might accidentally fire off a round. Into Oopsie. The wall. Yeah, yeah, I was young, but. Um, I've also dropped a pistol before, a three eighty, and it went off when it hit the ground. It was inside a carrying case, too, at the time that it happened. It was just happened to be loaded Yikes. in chambers. And uh, it hit, and I didn't even know that that pistol went off. It huh. just went crack. And, oh, okay. and I saw some plastic flying from the plastic box, and I said, how did I break that carrying case? You just thought it was... I just thought I, it, the it case snapped breaking. it. Yeah, because it acted as a suppressor. You know, three eighty is a very small pistol cartridge. Now. But... Uh, there are certain aspects of that case where I don't think it's as mysterious as as you would think it would yeah. be. Yeah, well, a house and can muffle blast, true. and in and then the the people that would be hearing it there in a house also. Yeah, and it's in the middle of the night, and they're asleep or you know not real alert. Yeah, and it might sound like a a, a backfire. Right. Yeah, I uh, guess that's from a true. car that happened to far away and you didn't really register it. Yeah. As what well, the thing that always struck me as being weird is the fact that they were all shot while they were laying in bed. Yeah. Now, the thing is, the thing is though, is that later on, as I got older, I'd hear accounts of people that had survived serial killers. All right, serial killer attack. One of them, one of them, was a little girl who a guy, a guy who would randomly go into people's houses. Kill everyone while they, you go to the master bedroom and kill the parents and anyone else, usually little kids in this case, and he'd shoot them too. Yeah. Well, he did that to one, and then he would steal the car and move on to the next family and do it. Uh, well, and he was a young guy. Well, in one case, the little girl survived it and she stayed in bed the whole time. And it seems to be that little kids will freeze in place like, uh, which I can like see a that. deer in a headlight. Yeah. And she heard the parents. Maybe they're so scared they don't shot. know what to do. Right. Yeah. They basically try to hide underneath the covers. Yeah, like it's a like a little kid would do. Yeah. Right. So I think that may have been why some of them were killed. You know. Yeah. Killed like that. Now his there's some people wonder whether or not his older sister may have helped. I was just going to mention that as the years went on. Right. Um, Butch DeFeo's story changed many times. Right. I don't think he ever admitted to doing it all by himself. Right. But some of the versions he told were that his one of his sister Dawn helped him, mm -hmm. um, or that 
he the, or that his family was trying to kill him so he was killing some of them in self defense and he only killed his mother his mother right. killed all of them and, and he had to kill her and you know what i mean so he's not the most stable individual is what i'm saying no and he doesn't tell the truth right and like i said his story has changed so many times for all we know he could have killed the parents while they were asleep in bed just shot the dad the mom wakes you know jumps up you know from asleep he shoots her too yeah and then the kids are all going, what happened? What happened? He goes, go back to bed. Yeah. You know? And it's your brother. So and you then don't he really... comes, right. And then he goes to the oldest sister and she's like, what the hell's going on? You know what I mean? And she sees the, the rifle coming towards her and she rolls over. He shoots her in the back. Yeah. So it may not be as mysterious yeah, as that's it true. looks. It and then the be. young kids are just in bed cowering, trying yeah. to hide underneath the covers. Yeah. May have been like that. Now, and this will be a significant detail later when we talk about the haunting. But at Butch DeFeo's trial, they were trying to do an insanity defense. Right. Like this, so they were trying to say that he was having paranoid delusions, mm-hmm. that his family were trying that he was hearing voices, right. um, telling him to kill his family, or that he thought his family were trying to kill him, or what have you. Um, spoiler alert: It did not work. But. Um, <laughs> They, they think he was probably on drugs or something like that, but uh, they, they, they did, didn't think he was he did insane. Heroin. Yeah, he, he was, was a heroin addict. He was a heroin addict. But anyway, so he went to prison. Well, he now, was a heroin addict, and another thing is that his dad was evidently pretty damn abusive. Yes, I have heard that also. He was that, abusive yeah. towards the wife and the, uh, the kids. Yeah. And I think that actually pushed Ronnie over the edge. Yeah, that would have been... Uh, I think he just wanted to kill the dad, and then he... And I think he did it kind of at the spur of the moment, and then he decided he had to kill all the witnesses and try to absolve right. himself of doing it. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it was pre-planned. I think it he, didn't seem to be. Did I it? think he came home late at night, high or drunk, and says, "I'm gonna take that sucker out." Yeah, yeah. that's probably exactly what happened. Right. I'm, I'm. I'm sure we'll never know, but right. but anyway, so he went to prison. He's still there. Now, about 13 months later, house was empty <clears throat> for a little over a year. And then along come George and Kathy Lutz. Yeah, I like the Lutzes. The Lutzes are interesting. Now, the the house, it's a very large house, very beautiful house, which... Uh, yeah, it's, been, it's iconic. It's, it's since been remodeled. Yeah. Um, they got rid of those windows because they yeah. said so many people were coming by to Yeah, they tried to make it, it so it wasn't recognizable. So it wasn't as recognizable, which, you know, you can understand. But um, so they came across the house... Uh, and it was selling for the very cheap price of $80,000, which was way below its market value. Yeah. And it had a little boathouse in the back and access yeah. to the it was to a, the Yeah, lake. it was on Amityville Creek or whatever. Quite cool. Was. Quite cool house. And, and this is a working class family, basically. Yeah. Not he, didn't, he had like a construction business or right, something yeah. like that, right? And... Um, <clears throat> and they had they had three kids right from uh, they were actually hers. They weren't both of they weren't uh, both of theirs. They were hers from a previous marriage, yeah. I believe. But, um, so now before they moved in, they knew that this was the defame. I don't know if they knew beforehand or if the realtor, I mean, cause I think realtors have to disclose. There's, there's, um, the story changes. Yeah. Some people say that they knew beforehand when they moved in because it was part of a plot. All right. Yeah. To, to make a book. Right. Cause you have to get into Ronnie DeFeo's, uh, attorney. Yeah. He was involved in some of this too. I don't know when you want to get in, into that. Yeah, we'll do that later. We'll do that we'll, later. We'll talk Why about we the haunting this, and then we'll... We'll talk about the haunting and the standard story first and then we'll yeah. talk about the alternative story. Yeah. But their story was that they right. were told right. that the house was the scene of the famous DeFeo murders, that six people had been murdered in there, and they said that it didn't bother them. Right. Because, you know, the house was so cheap. So they moved in... <clears throat> In uh, December of 1975. Now, they only stayed, famously, for 28 days before getting the fuck out of Dodge. Right. Because they claimed that the house was haunted. Yeah. And, I mean, the list of stuff that happened. Now, initially, they... They had a, um, and this is another kind of controversial thing. They had um, a Catholic priest come in and bless the house. Yeah, trying to clear it. Trying to clear it out. Now, this was before anything weird happened. Right. But um, George Lutz was not a Catholic. 
<clears throat> I believe he was a Methodist, but Kathy Lutz was a lapsed Catholic. She wasn't really practicing. Right. But they thought it would be a good idea because people had gotten murdered in there and stuff like that. Now, the story goes, and this is how it goes in Jay Anson's book, that when the priest came to the house on moving day, to bless the house. And in the book, he's called Father Mancusco, I think, but that's mm. not his real name. His real name is Father Pecoraro or Pecorero or something like that. They changed his name for the book. But um, he said that when he went into the house, he went up into the iconic room with the little quarter moon windows. It was windows. a sewing room, I think. Well, he, well, what happened was he went up there yeah. um, and heard a voice tell him to get out right. just like in the movie where it says get out like i said yeah. like i just put it at the beginning of the podcast mm -hmm. there and he says that he did not tell the lutzes that he had heard the voice upstairs at the time yeah. he just told them don't make that a bedroom okay right but later on it it was even questioned whether he even came there okay like there was a lot of different because in the movie, obviously, they showed, like, the room filling up with flies and all this other stuff. And that that didn't happen. Right. But he said he did hear a voice. But then later on, in another interview, he said, oh, I never even went there. I just talked to them on the phone. Okay. So I don't really know right. if he showed up. But in the book, he did. Now, <clears throat> so after that, during the 28 days they were there, they had all kind of crazy shit happen. And the book and the movie, according to George Lutz, were fairly accurate. Hmm. They said that it was, you know, obviously blown a little bit out of proportion because it's a movie. But most of the stuff you saw in the movie, they did claim to Happen. have happened. Okay. Um, they did say George did start waking up mm -hmm. at 3.15 in the morning, which they kind of implied in the book and the movie that that was when the DeFeo murders had happened. happened. But I don't think that the coroner ever established a concrete time of death. Time right. of death right. Because they'd been dead so long before right. they were found. So, you know, I don't think that it was exactly 315 or whatever. But that's that was... The, that, that sounded good in the book, so that's what they put. Yeah, so 315, he would keep waking up and stuff like that. And um, he also, just like in the movie, he was always cold. He was always, like, stoking the fire. He could never, um, He could never get warm. And the house was actually, even though it was wintertime, it was December when they moved in, there were just, you know, swarms of flies. They were not just in that room. They said they were kind of everywhere, and uh, which was unusual because it was very cold outside. Now, uh, Kathy Lutz also started having nightmares about the murders, which isn't terribly paranormal. I mean, if you moved right. into a house where you knew that all of these horrible... Things that happened, you might have probably, nightmares yeah. about it. I mean, I probably would. But um, they also noticed that their kids started sleeping on their stomachs, which I guess they hadn't done before. Right, kind of like the kids, kinda like got, the kids yeah. who had gotten shot. Um, Kathy also said that she would feel like arms around her, like yeah, hugging, she's not like being not, embraced. Yeah, like not aggressively, but like yeah. actually kind of in a loving way, which yeah. is kind of creepy. <laughs> Then there was the hidden room. Yeah, then there was the red room, which the book and the movie portrayed as being like behind a stone wall and it wasn't on the house plans and stuff like that. Now, later on, it kind of came to light that it actually hadn't been behind a wall. It was just a little alcove right. down in the cellar. And it was... It was painted red. Yeah, I think it was a toy room, wasn't it? Where yeah, they, they just kids. yeah they just used it as. That's a, what the old the, the people that lived there before said it was you know before they did said that that was and not the Lutzes. I think that well no, no excuse me not the DeFeos. I think it was already painted red before the DeFeos moved in there. I wasn't believe it was yeah. And then it was a, it was a toy room. Yeah. Where they'd store toys and it was painted red because yeah. that was the paint that that they had. Yeah, they just said yeah. we painted it that color right. because we had some leftover red paint. Right. We just put it on the wall, you know. So, you know, they said there wasn't anything sinister. And these are the people that lived there before the DeFeos lived there. Yeah. Now, the Lutz has said that their dog, I think, was affected by that. Room. Yeah, they so, said the dog really didn't like it and would like, right. bark at it and dig and stuff. Mm. But like I said, I'm pretty sure it wasn't, like, behind a wall. Because, you know, no. in the movie, they showed George Lutz, like, knocking the... Wall down because the dog kept digging at the wall, you know. I heard it described later on, and I, and I, I don't remember who did... who said this it may have been um 
one of the Lutzes. What's his name uh, again? The uh, the the father, uh, George. George. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. George Lutz said that it just had a normal door jam. It was just a closet, but the door was missing. Oh, yeah, okay. I think that's how he described it. All right, it wasn't something that was that you had to tear down stones to get to to get to it. No. Yeah, which I mean made it scarier in the movie, right. but yeah, yeah that's, that's a better way to. It's better. To and I actually, I found, I found some pictures of it, so yeah. I'll put that in the YouTube video, which right. it doesn't look super sinister. Um, they also started to notice, like I said, cold spots. Uh, they also noticed weird smells around the house, perfume, bile, shit, yeah. stuff like, like that. that. Um, George would hear uh, the front door slamming open and shut, and then he would go down there and it wasn't like nothing was different. Hmm. He also said that he heard um, something that sounded like an orchestra tuning up. Yeah, I remember him. I remember him saying that. Yeah, that he would hear that downstairs, and then he would go downstairs, and there'd there be would nothing be nothing there. there. Um, he also, they said they also saw like a demon face, like in the fireplace, like burned into the soot, like yeah, in the soot back there, in the yeah. back, which they kind of put in the movie too. Yeah. And because um, there was that whole thing where. And they went into this in the movie, and I guess I don't, I can't, I guess I can kind of see it. It was that George and um, Butch DeFeo kind of looked alike. Yeah. But like I said, it's the 70s. Everybody had those porn stashes. It's like, I, you know, it's like I. <laughs> he had a full beard. I mean, yeah, yeah, I was like, do they look alike? I don't know. I can't really tell. I'll tell I you guess what, they kind of do. The, the the movie, I saw it when I was a kid. Yeah, me too. Uh, the, the movie has a certain charm to it that it can't really be does. Today. I really like that movie. Yeah. Like, I, and. Not too long ago, I saw the remake, which I think was made in 2005, something like that. And it actually wasn't terrible. Um, it wasn't great, but it, you know, it, they exaggerated a lot more, like yeah. with them seeing the ghost of the little girl, which nobody right. ever claimed to see that. No. But um, the original, I think the original is a classic. Yeah. They're, They'd be like trying to reshoot The Exorcist. You can't reshoot The Exorcist. You can't. Oh, I'm the, sure they'll try it. Yeah. Like. But it would just make it worse. Yeah. It really did. I mean, it, it was kind of one of those things where you kind of had to see it at the time. And yeah. It's like the whole context the of the time. The 70s feel and the context yeah. of the time and the way society was when that first came out. It was just perfect. Yeah. yeah. You, you wouldn't understand if you weren't there. Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, like you, I was a little kid when that came yeah. out. That's I saw it on TV and that scared the shit out of me. Oh my God. I <laughs> yeah. thought it was so scary when I was little. And I was uh, like, I was into horror movies when I was a kid, but for some reason that one really creeped the fuck out of me. Yeah. But um, since we're talking about it now, also one of Kathy's uh, children, Missy, the youngest daughter, she apparently uh, started to have an imaginary friend. Yeah, Jody. Named Jody. Yeah. Now in the remake... They made Jody one of the DeFeo kids that got killed, but that's not accurate. They didn't have a kid named Jody. Mm-hmm. Um, what Jody was was a pig yeah, that walked on two legs yeah. that had red eyes. Yeah. Sometimes it was the size of a teddy bear, okay. and sometimes it was as big as the house. Big as the house, awesome. Yes. Like a Yule cat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See last week's show for a reference. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so actually, I think that scared me more than anything when I was a kid. It was like a giant pig like wandering yeah. around the house. So, and this pig was apparently seen. Why a pig? I don't know. It was a pig creature. That, but he walked up right. Or she. I guess yeah. Jody could be either thing. Yeah. But uh, it was apparently seen a couple of times. Now They claim to have seen it. They claim to have seen it. Yeah. Kathy Lutz said that she looked out of Missy's second floor bedroom window mm-hmm. And saw red eyes looking yeah. back in at her. Right. Um, George, and I believe this happened on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, he was out in the boathouse at night and he was coming back to the house and he looked up at Missy's window and he saw Missy standing in the window with a big pig creature behind her. Wow. <laughs> he said he saw that. <laughs> and Man. also, they said that one morning they went outside and there were big pig footprints in the snow. Okay. Like outside. Wow. Although that can't be entirely accurate because um, geeky pedantic people mm-hmm. have noted that the day they claim to have seen that in the book, there was no snow. No snow. snow. That day. Yeah. There was no snow that day. I have a feeling that the eyes at the window might have been a cat all on the windowsill. That's what I'm thinking because, and here's like a when I was little, mm-hmm. I was maybe six or seven years old, mm-hmm. and I was sleeping in my room. Yeah. And I woke up and it was kind of dark in there. And I looked at my window and there was red eyes in my window. Yeah. And I lost my shit. What was I it? I screamed for my mom. What was it? I don't know. Okay. Well, because I, I screamed for my mom. Oh, mom, mom. Yeah. 
<laughs> There's like something outside. My dad got the gun and like went around the house and stuff it was like a that. It was, probably, probably that's raccoon. what he said. He said, yeah, it was probably a raccoon. I was like, no, it was Jody. Yeah. <laughs> raccoon looking in. It was Jody, you guys, yeah. outside my window. He's He got mad and he came to my house. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> So yeah, boy, time's going by fast. Almost. It is, yeah, I know. Crap. Okay. okay. Um, what else we got? Yeah. What, so what else did they report? So like I said, you know, George and George started to notice that he was looking more like Butch DeFeo, okay. and that he he was starting to hang out at the same bar down mm-hmm. the street, which the book said was called the Witch's Brew, but that's not actually what it's called. It's called something else, but I can't remember what. Um, but you know, so and also Kathy started getting um attacked. Like, apparently she floated out of bed a couple of times. She started developing these red welts on her chest. Hmm. And George Lutz reported that on at least one occasion, he turned toward her in bed and she had turned into a 90-year-old hag. Yeah. Like, she had gotten really old. Her hair had gone all yeah. white and she looked yeah, like I, a horrible I remember, old woman. I remember on Art Bell, he said that happened on a couple of Okay. That's what I thought. It happened. And it took a while months. for it to wear off. That's yeah. weird. Weird. Which that seems like, <laughs> like I honestly, and i you know, full disclosure, I kind of think most of the story is bullshit. We haven't gotten to that part but yet. But that seems That's like pretty... so weirdly specific. Yeah. Yeah. Like you took, you know, like what if yeah. I turned over and you looked like, oh, I don't want to think about yeah. that. That would creep me out if I turned over and you looked like a big, like bridge troll or something like I already that. do look like a bridge troll. You do kind of. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, okay, let's move <laughs> on. Let's move on. Okay. And uh, so also they had a lot of trouble with uh, the locks in the house, like the doors yeah. and the windows they would they would break or, you know, un, you know unexplained. Um, also, they saw now in the movie at the end, they saw like that black goop like coming out of the walls and out of the toilet and stuff like that. Um, actually, in the book, they claimed it was green and it never came out of the toilet, although it came oozing out of the walls a couple times. Now, in the book, did they ever take a sample? Of course not. Of course not. Of course okay. not. They never do. And what would happen? What what supposedly happened to this green stuff? Did it just evaporate away? See, I don't think they ever said that either. They just said, oh, it was running down the walls. It's suspect. Okay. What else? And, you know, that part at the end where he was, you remember, like, at the end of the movie when he ran back in to get the dog? And and then he fell into the goop in the stairs. He said, yeah, that didn't happen. happen. Although I have to say that the Lutz family, and as far as I know, they said, because most of them are dead now, but, um, well, the George and Kathy are dead, right? Yeah. They didn't live long. That's funny. Yeah, they died pretty young. They died pretty young, yeah. But, um... They, uh, you know, they, they said that the thing that kind of that last night when they were there, like mm-hmm. in the movie, it was very dramatic and the door mm-hmm. flew off the hinges and all this other shit. Um, but they never really specified what had, happened. what had happened on that last night that made them get the fuck out. Yeah. I think they left that open. They said they didn't want to talk about yeah, it. Yeah. They said, like, oh, it was too frightening and yeah, we don't want to yeah. talk about it. You know what I mean? All and right. maybe they did that just to like leave some mystery. Sure, so, sure. you know, so. I think so. So the whole story wasn't Well, out some there. people have surmised that maybe maybe he got possessed and tried to kill the family, so they got out there. Yeah. And he didn't want to admit the fact that he got possessed and tried to kill the family. That, yeah. Because that, that would have been a good that would have been a good twist on the story that he almost got possessed by the devil and yeah. the same the same way uh, Ronnie DeFeo did. Yeah. And tried to kill his family, but he was strong enough to resist it. Yeah. Because they did, I mean, that was kind it of was the kind direction. Of implied, the, the, that was the direction that the because. But I the, think that was implied more for like the book purposes or the case purpose, and then they changed. They, they made an ending for the book and the movie. Yeah, yeah. because yeah, in the movie they did. Um, because didn't he have dreams about cutting up his, like, yeah. chopping up his family yeah. and stuff like that? Like, because remember that was that great scene that, and actually, this was one of the scenes other than the Jody one that scared the crap out of me, where he was having the dream that he's he hit uh kathy in the head with an axe and like split her head open i don't remember that you don't remember that scene remember. oh I, my I, god we have to see this movie again oh my god the we that the scared the again. shit out of me yeah because i've always been like super scared of like axes and like beheadings and yeah. that kind of crap so so that like really disturbed me that scene i still remember it but um they also said that they heard voices like they they tried to bless the house themselves like they went around with right. crucifixes and bless this house and blah 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 and apparently um they heard a voice saying will you stop <laughs> knock that shit knock off. It off knock it off we're yeah. trying to sleep in here yeah. <laughs> but um 
Yeah. So actually, let's take a break right now because we're right at the so halfway point. So that's all the reported phenomena? More so or less, cool. more or less. Okay. And then, so we'll take a break right now and then we'll come back and we'll kind of talk about what happened in the aftermath of it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So we're going to be back in just a few minutes. The Necrocasticon. The podcast that blends horror and heavy metal properties with a common connection. Brought to you by hosts, Talking Tom Clock, Max X, Smoking Wart Hades, and Azriel Mordecai. Featuring interviews and more with the stars of Metal and Horror. The Necrocasticon, Mondays on Project Entertainment Network. If you're into cosplay, corsetry, steampunk, gothic, or rockabilly clothing, shoes, and accessories, then you must visit Subculture Corsets and Clothing, either online at www.subculturecorsets.com or drop by their store at the Avenues Mall in Jacksonville, Florida, located a half mile off I-95. Tell them you heard their ad on Project Entertainment Network and the 13 o'clock podcast and receive a 10% discount off your entire purchase. Or when checking out on their website, use the discount code 13 o'clock and receive a 10% discount on your entire order. And if you're a full-figured girl, don't worry. Subculture carries sizes 4 through 4X, and they have men's clothing as well. That's subculturecorsets.com, and use discount code 13 o'clock for a 10% discount. Go check out their website now, subculturecorsets.com, or when traveling through Jacksonville, Florida, stop in and check out their store at the Avenues Mall. I'm Captain Dallas Lee, and I'm one of the characters in the Kirkman Journals. Project Entertainment Network's Pro Wrestling Podcast. Every Friday, Token Top Clark, Steve Messer, and the Vaki Superkick Pro Wrestling in the Hot Spot. Featuring interviews with the up and coming indie superstars that are stable that shoots while it works. You can only hear them on the Project Entertainment Network. <laughs> Thank you very much. Remember the Alamo! Hey everyone, there's a brand new podcast starting on December 1st, the Dead TV Podcast, where we take shows from the horror industry that have been cancelled or ended and review them episode by episode, starting with Kindred the Embraced and Constantine. And you'll have to stick around to see what the third show that we're doing immediately after those. Joining me for this amazing new podcast is Mistress Zeneca. Hello everyone, thanks for having me. Mr. Zeneca is an event hostess of kinky, geeky, and sexy parties around the Philadelphia area. She has a flair for the dramatic and is passionate about zombies. She also teaches on a wide variety of BDSM topics, including high protocol. In fact, you can say she wrote the book on it, which you can find on her website, www.elegantlykinky.com. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. Chris is a longtime horror fan and turned that love of horror into an almost decade-long radio show called Radio of Horror. He wrote a children's Halloween book in 2012 called Give Me Something Good to Eat and has a comic book forthcoming where he gender swaps the entire cast of Dracula. Looking forward to that. On the side, he also makes short horror films in Massachusetts. So how could I say no? And you can get all the updates about our podcast on our Facebook page, The Dead TV Podcast, and eventually a forthcoming Twitter page as well. So stay tuned for the first episode coming December 1st. There are terrors, real and imaginary, and I write about them all. Paranormal nonfiction, horror fiction, the Rochdale House Poltergeist, of Fire the Spurs, Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist, the Associated Hopeful Monsters, Monsters, Red Menace, the, the Five Tenebris Bellwether. Go to www.jennyashford.com or search Amazon for the Jenny Ashford author page. Okay. So, now, all of this shit happened. Like I said, they left the house 
in mid-January. So they were only there for 28 days. Are they? Yeah, they were there for 28 days. Excuse <coughs> me. And they left all their shit in the house. They took off. They got their dog. They took off. They went to um, Kathy's mother's house. Now, in the book, they said that the phenomena followed them to the mother's house. But they didn't really specify any part of What it had. Right, yeah. And like I said, the last night they were there, they did they wouldn't really specify what exactly had happened or why, you know, why this one thing had like made them leave when this shit had supposedly been going on for twenty eight days or whatever. Now, after they left and the Warrens had gotten involved with this too, although I don't think they came to the house until afterward. Right. Yeah, and I don't um, think they were in the book, in in the movie or the book. Were they, they didn't mention them now, no. but uh, there are pictures of them in the house. Right. Yeah. They, and it's confirmed that they investigated. Yeah, the they were there. And there was a lot of stuff after this ha- haunting that happened. I mean, they even had a TV special about this house. Remember? Yeah. They did a seance in there. Yeah. On live TV, I believe it was live. Yeah. It was bullshit. But. Which, yeah, which kind of makes me suspect the veracity of the story and there were people going in there with cameras to investigate it and taking pictures in there and there's a famous picture of what looks like a little boy's head peeking around a corner yeah yeah and the lutzes didn't have anything to do with that they weren't in the house at the time that yeah they happened. had left that already. was that was i believe a professional ghost hunting team yeah came up with that photo very suspect yeah and what makes it even more suspect <laughs> is that I mean, pretty much... Now, Jay Anson, the guy who wrote the book um, on which the movie was based later on, he actually never um, spoke to George and Kathy Lutz in person, but they made about 45 hours worth of recordings, and that's what he used to write the book from. Now, if you see... I've seen a lot of interviews with George and Kathy Lutz. Mm -hmm. They don't seem like they're bullshitting. And he didn't change his story, I mean, yeah. for years and years after. Gotta give it to him the credit. They, they stuck to that story. They really did. Yeah. But there are a lot of iffy aspects to this case. Name um, tell, tell me what's iffy about Well, here's the thing. Now, Ronald DeFeo's defense attorney. That's where it really starts to get Weber. Kind of, William yeah. Weber, was that his name? Yeah. You start. It starts raising raising some warning signs right there when the, when DeFeo's attorney gets involved in this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he claimed that the whole thing was a fabrication, that he and George and Kathy had had a meeting, drunk a bunch of wine, and mm-hmm. come up with this story to make some money. Yeah. And also, there was an, an author involved too. Yeah, right? yeah. Jay Anson, like Jay I said. Yeah. Oh, okay. And also to bolster DeFeo's defense, DeFeo's defense because yeah. they wanted to claim that there was some kind of evil force in the house that made him do it. That they, made him do it, it and that he wasn't responsible. Do, yeah, the devil made him do it defense. Yeah. And, you know, so like I said, the attorney came out later. Actually, it wasn't even that much later. It was only about a year or two after the book came out Yeah, that he came out and said, yeah, we just made that all up. Yeah. And when you have some shit like that go down in a paranormal story, you can pretty much throw it out. Yeah. When you have a witness or, you know, at the center of the case come out saying, no, we made all this up for money. Yeah. You can pretty much throw it out. Yeah. That's, that's the sad thing about this case. Yeah. But... The Lutzes really did stick to that story. They and, really and, you did. you know, they sound kind of compelling, which kind of shifts it back towards maybe something did kind of happen. And they just kind of... they just blew it out of proportion. There's but, no way of knowing. But here's the thing. Think of how easy it would be. What if you and me yeah. bought a house where a very high-profile murder had taken place? Right. And we got it for super cheap and all this. I mean, what's kind of the first thing? It's like, hey, let's make a bunch of money. Right. And we'll say, because people would believe that shit was haunted. But you know what? Here's the th- here's where that thinking breaks down. They got a good deal on that house. They and did. they ran from it without paying for it. 
All That's right. true. Left a lot of their stuff in there. Although they went back later and got it. Oh, did they went yeah, back and they later did. and got it? Okay. Yeah. But they defaulted on that house, and they really didn't make that much money off that book, off that story. About three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand? Oh, okay. I thought it was a fraction of that. No, nah, three hundred thousand. So they profited. Well, that's how much they admitted to. So they profited off of it. Yeah. Oh. That's how much they admitted they made. It might have been more. Because here's the thing. I was under the impression, based on the interviews, that it was like ten thousand. No. Twenty thousand. No. Yeah. Okay. So they made a pretty good amount. They amount admitted of money to three hundred thousand. Three hundred thousand. Yeah. I didn't remember that. So it was probably more than that. Hey, probably a million. It might have been. Yeah. I mean, that book sold a lot of copies. Yeah. And that movie did really well. And actually, that whole, I don't know if they would have got money for all the, because that, mo- that movie, like, that spawned, like, a franchise. They made, yeah. like, a ton. But, like, the ones now are kind of shitty. They're just, like, direct to DVD. But they made a shit ton of those movies. I think it's likely that it was a hoax because the people at the center of the case said it was a hoax. So that's very likely that it's a hoax. I'll tell you what, it's a damn good story. It is a, it is a damn good story. Now, the, one of the things that really makes me think that it was a hoax is when you just look at the, look at the case and the evidence that they reportedly witnessed. If you really analyze it, it does not fit poltergeist phenomena. There's no, no. young focus. There's no asportations of object or apportations. There's no objects actually physically being moved by telekinesis. You know, it's not, not nothing really. like the... I think it, the it, only... It actually, the there was maybe one... Um, there was a, there was a couple instances of that, and I think I forgot to mention them earlier. One was like some of the crosses they had on the walls would turn upside down. Yeah. And also, um, one time, George said that he was walking through the living room and a little um, statue of a lion that they had like appeared like under his feet. Yeah, and Still, then that's and then not later, enough. no, that's not and then later to, he said he had bite marks on his ankle. It's not enough to be a classic poltergeist case. What they're describing is something more like a demonic haunting, yeah, an interactive demonic type haunting, or but some people call it a demonic infestation, whatever that is. Yeah, that's what they're describing. Yeah. Now the now um, the Warrens are involved, or they get involved in it later. And yeah. of course, you know, with, with, with Ed Warren, he was a demonologist. Yeah. All right. If he saw something, he was going to say it was a demon. Yeah. You know, just Ed shows up, it's demons automatically. That's what he's going to say, because that's what you say when you're a demonologist. Yeah. That's and your that, bread and butter. Yeah. So, uh, I don't even know what I was getting at. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, it's a great case. I believe it to be a hoax. Yeah. And like I said... There are really more things pointing to it being a hoax than not. And I'm willing to give them that maybe some weird little shit happened. Maybe some doors closed by, you know, maybe it was like. Maybe it was creepy in there. Maybe it was. Yeah. I mean, you know, people got murdered in there. That's pretty creepy. And, you know, maybe it was just low level shit. Like what happens at our house? Like the TV came on by it comes on by itself. Oh, tell them about the tell about the sponge. Oh, listen to this shit, you guys. This just happened the yeah. other day, speaking of poltergeist activity. Yeah. We have it every now and then. You know, yeah, I was a poltergeist focus when I was a little kid. Yeah, it, go it listen. Comes we, back every now we have a show about it, uh, the Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist, which yeah, we've was about him as a about kid. It. We've yeah. been, done lots of podcasts and shows on it. But so we so every now and then we still have like weird shit happen at our house. Yeah. Like I said, the TV comes on by itself a lot, yeah. shit like that. I was cooking. What was I cooking? Um, you were cooking, we were making a pan pizza, weren't we? Yeah, I was making a pan pizza, and I was totally focused on what I was doing. Yeah. And you had your back turned, and I was looking at you. I took the stone out of the oven. Took the stone out of the oven, put it on the counter. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, we heard this really loud... Boom! Yeah, like a really loud... Boom! Yeah. ...noise like that. Yeah. And I'm and like... it was coming from the direction... Kind yeah, of where that stone was. Yeah, and it was coming from behind pizza your Pizza stone. Yeah, I yeah. Took, took a pizza stone out of the oven. <laughs> it was hot, but it wasn't all that hot. Yeah. 200 degrees, maybe, the time that I took that stone out. Yeah. Because I wasn't going to use that stone making a pan pizza. I was yeah. going to use a cast iron pan. So I put that stone on the counter, and I heard some go, boom! And I turned around and looked at it, and I yeah, said, well, did that crack? I that's what we thought, because it was so loud. Yeah. And I'm looking at it, and then tell what you saw. And then he had just thrown like a, a frying pan. He had fried some vegetables and he just put it in the sink. Yeah. And in the sink, like on the frying pan, there was a little dish sponge that had not been there before. Yeah. So what had happened was somehow I put the, the stone on the countertop 
near the sink, turn around and hear it go, boom! And then I look down in the sink to say, what was that? You go, that's not a... <laughs> you said, look at that. And I looked in the sink and there was now a dried sponge. You know how a sponge with it's got a scouring pad on one side and a sponge yeah. on the other? It's dried and it's in the frying pan. And that wasn't there before. No, because he had just put that in the... Sink. I picked it up and dropped it and it made a similar noise. But not loud. But not, not as loud. loud. I tried to throw it into that pan to make that bong sound and couldn't do it. And it was just like the... Uh, just like the TV, the TV remote. Yeah. Cause that's and a we very... don't know where that sponge came from. No. Yeah, because nor- we keep two by the sponge, but there were two. Yeah, and they'd be on the side. The two were on the side. So how does something so I don't know where... the... the how does I don't some... know where that third one came from. It's like it would have to have fallen from the ceiling. I think it somehow just kind of teleported a few inches off of it and hit it. But you never catch it in the act. No, you never do. Okay. We just heard the noise and turn around. Yeah, weird. Okay, good. Let's but that's a pretty, I mean, that's a pretty common poltergeist thing. Yeah. Shit is louder than it. It's louder than it should be. Than it should be. It, right. But, um, so yeah, like we were saying, the, the Lutzes did actually benefit from this. Um, the book that Jay Anson wrote, uh, sold over 3 million copies and the movie, uh, you know, with Margot Kidder and stuff like that made over $80 million. And, the Lutz family, I mean, after the book and the movie came out, you know, they were all over the media, right. like talking about their story and stuff like that, which, you know, I don't begrudge them trying to make some money off it if it really happened. Yeah. You know it what I mean? It sounds like it was set up between the lawyers and an author and them and they were going to, they were going to make some cash on this story. Yeah. And, and that, help out, help out old DeFeo. Yeah. And th- th- I think that was the whole, and actually they were trying the- to get him free. They were trying to give him a lighter sentence or put him into a, I think or put him into an insane asylum. Right. Yeah. Because they didn't want him going to prison for life. But right. like I said, it didn't work out. And I think even Butch DeFeo, as nutty as he is and all the, mm-hmm. you know, shit he came up with to absolve himself of what he did. Mm-hmm. I mean, even he said, yeah, you know, the lawyer and them, they came up with the, oh, he did? the story, he did. And, you know, so what, like I said, whether it really happened, I don't know. And there seems to be a lot of this kind of shit going on with, because uh, I think actually in the in the book I'm writing about this, mm-hmm. I kind of merged this story with uh, the one about the Snedecker family, that's the haunting weird. in Connecticut. Oh yeah, that's another that they good made story. the movie out of because it's the a because good it's story, well it's boy, similar. Yeah, it's very similar because the Warrens were also involved in this yeah. one, and it was same kind of like demonic yeah. kind of shit. Yeah, and they you know they ended up making a movie about it, and the family made a bunch of money. It's a good story, very very questionable. Yeah, I, I wish these two cases, those two cases, were true, but I don't think they are. No. No. Like I said, I don't, I don't think so either. No. If, even if like a little shit just happened in the house, like a little door slam and right. shit like that. And they're just like, oh, shit's coming out of the walls. Yeah. And there's like a giant pig walking there's around. There's a lot of stuff in common between the two. And it's just, the cases are too good to be true, if you ask me. Yeah. Well, and they, and I think we discussed this on the Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist case, that poltergeist phenomena don't really tend to follow a plot. It's just kind no. of random shit. Well, they're not claiming it to be classic poltergeist. They're That's claiming true. it to be some kind of a demonic, interactive haunting. That's making people That's do shit. That's making people do things. And there's li- and and in the way they're describing a demonic, a demonic interactive haunting, they're, they're, they're contaminating it with things, with, with, with incidences or things or phenomena that happens usually in poltergeist. So they're kind of merging the two. Although there are some cases that seem to be pretty good where the two phenomena are kind of merged. Yeah. To a certain extent. The, the Snedeker case, the one that's the one that was in the uh the 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 uh the funeral home with yeah. the kid with the cancer. It's a good story. Yeah. It has a lot of elements, the Hollywood elements in it. Yeah. It'd be neat if that did happen, but I'd have to do a fucking complete investigation on my own of what's actually out there about that case. And I don't know every aspect. I just know the official story. Yeah. The one that they put out. Yeah. But I think there's a lot more to it than that. Which I'm sure there is. You're right. Because that's the thing. You can't really... When we were kids, they were doing the talk show circuit. I remember that Yeah, I remember that too. And uh, they had people that lived on that street calling bullshit on them. Well, because it must be said that the people that moved into the house mm-hmm. after the Lutzes left 
They lived there for at least 10 years. No, I'm talking about the haunting in Connecticut. Oh, haunting in Connecticut. Yeah, in that case, the people that lived on that house uh, called bullshit on them, saying that they were hoaxing it from the very beginning. Yeah, there was I nothing wrong that. with that house. Yeah. And that, but uh, the, the, the family that was involved with it fought tooth and nail, saying, oh, no, that did stuff did happen. Yeah, which you know, I don't know. I'd have to see how close they. But like I said, that was that that was something that happened in the Amityville case too. Is that the people that moved in after the Lutz family? um, You know, they knew about it obviously because it was super famous. But they lived there for at least ten years, and they said nothing weird happened here. They said the weirdest thing that happens is all the dumbass people driving by here, like and gawk at it, right? To gawk at their house, you know what I mean? It also should be said, and I think I mentioned a little bit about this earlier. But that the Catholic priest that was brought in to bless the house mm-hmm. in the movie, um, it came out because after the book came out, after the movie came out, there were a bunch of lawsuits yeah. between the Lutzes, between various lawyers, between publishers, between, you know, the Lutzes mm-hmm. were suing everybody. They were getting countersued and all this other shit because of, you know, just various things. The Lutzes mm-hmm. claiming they were using their name and likeness without... Right. record whatever and you know and then they would get countersued and all this other shit so a lot of these details came out like in the court cases okay. afterward okay now uh lutz versus weber uh in which george and kathy sued william weber the attorney who apparently um who said that he conspired with them to do the story so they actually sued him later so whether he was just saying that they that he made the story up with them because he was mad that they were suing him or, you know, they were trying to cast aspersions on each other, I don't really know. But during this lawsuit, um, the priest, who, like I said, in the book, he was called uh, Mancusco, Father Mancusco, but his real name is Ralph Pecorero. And um, in the book, Pecorero said that he had known the Lutzes for a long time, that he had come to the house on moving day, that he had heard the voice, blah de blah But on the stand, he said that he had only met the Lutzes, you know, a couple months previous. Right. Because they said, oh, they, oh, he knew them before they were married and stuff like that, but he didn't. At, at least that's what he said on the stand, that he didn't know them. And he also said that... The only thing that happened was that they, the Lutzes called him right. about blessing the house, but that he never actually went there. Huh. So, what? So whether he actually lied, like in the book, right, or whether the just author made just up. made that up. Well, you know what they're going to say. The people that defend the case are saying, "Oh no, he went there. He did all that, but because of his vows as a priest, he." Uh, confidentiality and blah 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 and the fact that he didn't have permission from the Vatican he's gonna say that he didn't go but it did happen but that's what they're gonna say yeah no it said what happened is that during the trial he said that nothing weird had happened in the house Mm -hmm. but then he said that he wasn't at the house it was like this huge clusterfuck so we don't really know I mean he's dead now so you know I don't really know what the truth of the matter (laughs) is but um he got moved to another diocese later, like before he died. But he just later he said nothing happened. The case is pretty contaminated. It's yeah. very contaminated. I'd say there's nothing to it at this point. There's nothing to it other than a really cool movie and a good book. And you can go on, uh, you know, like recordings of Art Bell shows when the Lutzes are doing interviews and they do an awesome video interview. I love the stories. I mean, it, it's, Pretty compelling what they say. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I don't know. I don't think it's true. Yeah. But it sure is good entertainment. Like I said, you got to give them props for sticking to the story for that long. Right. And actually, didn't we see, this was probably like last year or something like that. Didn't we see that documentary that had one of their kids? Yeah, the the kid. Who had grown up. Right. And he's kind of nutty. Yeah, he seemed a little uh, yeah. troubled. And he blamed it all on George and his involvement with black magic that he didn't want to talk about. I didn't That's buy That's right. I, I didn't forgot buy, all about that. I didn't buy a word of what the kid was saying. Or I don't call him a kid, but you well, know. Well, yeah, he was a kid at the time. A kid at the time. I, I don't buy a word of it. But it was interesting to watch. Yeah. It was, I wish I could remember the name of that now. It's yeah. probably, it's, I think it's on YouTube. We saw it on yeah. YouTube. But yeah, it's one of his grown up kids. You can probably find it if you search. But yeah, yeah he. It was on Netflix. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he he claimed 
apparently him and George Lutz, who was his stepfather, obviously. Yeah, he didn't like him. He didn't like him, and they yeah. didn't get along. And so he, he blamed it all. Oh, he, yeah, he was doing black magic. He had magic spell books. And, uh, you know, didn't like, he say he was abusive also? Yeah. I think he did. Yes, he was abusive. So, you know, who knows? And I think at the, I think at the point that this documentary came out, George Lutz was dead, right? Yeah, so he was he couldn't dead. Really, couldn't yeah, defend he himself. He couldn't really defend himself. I mean, Kathy Lutz, Kathy Lutz had been dead for quite a while. She died pretty yeah, young. Yeah, she died, she died pretty young, yeah. Yeah. Of cancer, if I remember. I mean, now they had divorced before she died. They were already right? divorced, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because, okay. That's what I thought. But, you know, at any rate, like I said, great movie. It's a classic. Yeah. I don't, uh, you know, I don't know how appreciated it was at the time. I was, I was just thinking of like how Stephen King thought it was a stupid movie. He's like, it's yeah. a good movie, but it's kind of a stupid movie too. Yeah. Which it kind of is. It's, yeah. it's kind of a dumb horror movie, but uh, you know, it scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. So that's... It was it was good in its day. Yeah. And yeah. the book was good too. I read the book yeah. a long time ago. But you know, do I think it really happened? Nah. Nah. I, I doubt it. So. I, I doubt really it. doubt it. And you know, but still, good story. Yeah. <laughs> okay let's wrap it up now. all right so we're gonna wrap it up now so mm-hmm. we hope you enjoyed this uh little breakdown of the amiable horror as we went off on our yeah various least, tan- at tan- least, tangents at least we got to do this case because I-, I wanted to talk about it eventually yeah so we can get it out of the way it's a famous case and uh you know we can move on to uh better ones yeah later Okay, um, so you guys remember that we still have t-shirts, so go get one. It's yeah. at www.zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock, mm-hmm. and uh, that'll probably pretty much do it. Like I said, hope everybody had a good holiday, and hope everybody has a good New Year's coming up. Don't drink and drive. And all oh, knock that. it off. No, Nonsense. knock it off. <laughs> Let them ride. Go ahead. Drink up, boys. <laughs> all right. See you, bye. See you next week. Bye.